The advisory board of the Boyle Lectures has occasionally regretted a phrase in Robert Boyle's will in which the sermons thus endowed, an endowment long exhausted in case you are wondering, that the, the sermons thus endowed were directed to prove the Christian religion against notorious infidels, followed by a list of such offenders, including Jews. So I was surprised lately to discover that when Manasseh ben Israel of Amsterdam visited London in 1655 to offer humble addresses to the Lord, to the Lord Protector aimed at encouraging the return of the Jews, Robert Boyle, with his sister Lady Ranler, was among those who paid him a visit in his lodgings in the Strand. The motives for the return of the Jews as eventually accomplished were variously economic and eschatological, the belief being held by some that opportunities to preach to the Jews was a condition of the promised parousia. Well, I do not imagine that Boyle's legacy was motivated by biblical purpose. His interest in Ben Israel may have been no more than curiosity. Happily, the codicil does not tell us what the Christian religion is or is not, so we may range freely there and continue Boyle's disciples. Others have had a different approach. Michael Faraday in the mid-19th century did not think it at all necessary to tie the study of natural sciences and religion together, considering them distinct systems and perhaps equally rigid. He has been placed in a tradition of scriptural physics, which since I'm inadequately versed in one and hopelessly ill-prepared in the other, leaves me puzzled. Certainly my inchoate ramblings around the discipline of biblical studies in preparation for ministry included no scientific excursion whatever, or else assuredly I would not be standing before you tonight. More competent is our parish director of music and organist, whom I mention because newly appointed, he is performing here for the first time tonight. More thoughtful and generous are our sponsors, Gresham College, the Worshipful Company of Grocers, part patrons of the parish, and the Mercers Company, to whom we owe particular and warm thanks for the arrangements tonight. Mark Harris's lecture will be available to all of you as you leave, and a recording, thanks to the staff of Gresham College, will be available on our website and on theirs before long. To introduce the lecturer and responder, I have pleasure in handing over to my colleague and the lecture's animator, Michael Byrne. Thank you, George. Ladies and gentlemen, it seems like only a very few years ago that we gathered here at St. Mary Le Beau for the first in a new series of Boyle lectures. But incredibly, a decade and a half have gone by since then, and we've had the great good fortune of hearing a talented array of speakers helping to clarify and challenge our thinking about the relationship between two great human endeavors science and theology. This evening, we're delighted to welcome two more outstanding speakers, for one of whom tonight actually marks his third time addressing a Boyle lecture audience. We are very honored to have Mark Harris and John Hedley Brook with us and look forward to another evening of original instruction and insight. I'm not sure if you share this experience, but I find that as Christmas approaches every year, I've saved up one or two big books, the kind you can only really get into when you have a few days away to enjoy what our American friends refer to as the holiday season. One of my big Christmas books this year was by Max Tegmark, a physics professor at MIT in Massachusetts, entitled Our Mathematical Universe. In a wonderfully instructive and anecdotal style, Tegmark discusses the origins of the universe and its inflationary expansion to form the enormous cosmos we observe today. He also recounts the story of particle physics, 
and how our sense of conventional reality dissolves and even disappears at the level of the very small, the quantum level. A unifying theme in Max Tegmark's absorbing account of our physical reality is the multiverse, the truly strange idea that reality is constantly splitting into parallel universes which contain all the different and alternative kinds of existence that might ever conceivably be. In one universe, we're sitting here tonight, eagerly awaiting Mark Harris's boy lecture, but there are other universes not immediately accessible to us, in which George Bush has already fallen asleep. <laughs> the sound system at St. Mary Le Beau works perfectly. <laughs> and post-debate refreshments are a mere five minutes away rather than the scheduled hour and 15. <laughs> I followed the first third of Max Tegmark's book reasonably easily. By the middle third, however, I was finding it tough going. For the last third, when it got, if I may use a technical phrase, seriously weird, I found myself asking whether his ideas were really plausible or just some kind of extended mathematical fantasy. But I had a similar experience leading up to Christmas when I read a book of short daily commentaries by an old friend of this lecture series, John Polkinghorne, called Living with Hope, a scientist looks at Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany. About a third of the religious insights offered by John in his book were of a kind I could broadly understand and relate to. Another third were more speculative and left me wondering not only whether this might really be the case, but if it was, how did he know? The last third of John Polkinghorne's comments, like the last third of Max Tegmark's physics book, when John discussed key theological concepts like the incarnation, the resurrection, and the trinity, left me wondering whether I could even begin to get a sense of what they mean, not to mention understand in what sense or in what universe they might conceivably be true. So both my Advent and Christmas readings in science and religion followed a similar pattern for me. At first, enthusiasm and ready acceptance, then an increasing sense of puzzlement and having to scratch my head in bemusement, until finally I had to admit no longer being able to understand the ideas each author was exploring. But if each of these two disciplines, science and theology, presents difficulties on its own, imagine the deeper sense of challenge we face when we try to think about ways in which these two puzzling disciplines interact. Now we really are operating in a higher dimension. Facing that difficulty and asking tough questions about the relationship between science and religion has been the ambition of the Boyle Lectures for the last 15 years. In some years, I think we can claim to have succeeded admirably in drawing the two disciplines closer together. In other years, the challenge has proved a little more intractable. I have no doubt that this evening's lecture will be in the first of these two categories. To respond to the lecture, we're delighted to welcome back John Headley Brook, a previous Boyle lecturer and responder, and for many years now, one of the trustees of this lecture series. I should point out to correct a mistake that crept into the invitation for this evening's lecture, that in a previous life, John held the Andreas Idrios Professorship of Science and Religion at Oxford, and not, as advertised on the invitation, at some other place. <laughs> there may be a parallel universe in which John Brooke <laughs> has a chair at that alternative location. But in the universe in which we're gathering this evening, John is very definitely an Oxford Emeritus Professor. As this year's main speaker, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Mark Harris, Senior Lecturer in Science and Religion at the University of Edinburgh. A distinguished scientist turned theologian and also an Anglican priest, Mark's lecture topic harks back to some of the earliest Boyle lectures held in this very church in the late 17th century. And I am delighted now to invite him to give the 15th Boyle Lecture on the topic, Apocalypse is Now, Modern Science and Biblical Miracles. I'll start my lecture now, and you may like to um, pay close reference to the handout I've made. I've tried to give you some hints to what I'm going to say in advance, some headings, but also the maps and some of the quotations will also help. 
Now, you will probably be wondering about my title, Apocalypse is Now. Of course, it's a reference to the film Apocalypse Now, the famous film of the Vietnam War. But this film is a far cry from science and theology. Why did I choose that title? Well, as you may well be aware, the film Apocalypse Now is a retelling of Joseph Conrad's novel, Heart of Darkness. And both the film Apocalypse Now and the novel Heart of Darkness explore the culture clash between the technologically advanced West and a supposedly primitive culture, raising questions about imperialism and the heart of darkness in our modern world. Well, for those of you familiar with our own culture wars, and especially the supposed conflict between science and religion, talk of imperialism raises the specter of scientism, of the assumption that the natural sciences provide the most authentic route to knowledge, and that religion provides little better than primitive superstition in comparison. Well, I don't want to wade into that territory because previous Boyle lecturers have done that, but instead to tell you about some unexpected reversals which have gone under the radar, as it were, of the standard science and theology conversation. And these reversals concern the big miracle and catastrophe stories at the heart of the Bible, where God's purposes are revealed in nature. Apocalypses from the ancient world, if you like. So I'll introduce these stories and I'll explain how modern science, far from dismissing them as fantastic and primitive fairy tales, actually gives us new ways of hearing them. Hearing them as ancient stories of revelation, new retellings, apocalypses now. Let me say a little bit more by way of extended introduction. The contemporary science and theology scene has long been fascinated by the Bible's first few chapters. That's the, uh, the Genesis creation stories. And clearly that's at least partly because of the culture wars in our society, which are so fixated with creation versus evolution. I have played my own part in discussing this area, but I'm actually more intrigued by the rest of the Bible, particularly the many stories that tell how God redeems his people, sometimes punishes them, sometimes reveals his purposes to them, but often in very spectacular and terrifying ways through the natural world. Prime examples are in the book of Exodus, such as the story of God's revelation to Moses in the burning bush, or the plagues of Egypt, or the crossing of the Red Sea. And these biblical stories where nature runs riot to deliver God's purposes aren't so much supernatural as hypernatural. Nature itself becomes transcendent to reveal the divine. Now you find this motif appearing again and again in the Bible, obviously in places like the Psalms and the Prophets, but many other places too, including the classic apocalypses of which the prime example stands at the very end, that's the book of Revelation. And what has particularly intrigued me about these hypernatural texts is that I'm by no means the only scientist to be intrigued by them. In fact, there exists quite a substantial body of scientific writing that proposes naturalistic and scientific explanations for these bizarre and spectacular stories. And these explanations work on the assumption that the biblical text presents accurate observations of things that really happened in history. So the biblical stories become scientific data, if you like, descriptions of freak events and natural disasters that could be modeled scientifically. Well, this scientific interest in the Bible stories of miracle and hypernature is not new. Some notable scientists of the 17th and 18th centuries took an interest in applying their own wisdom to the Bible's miracle stories, including some Boyle lecturers such as Samuel Clarke and William Whiston. In fact, there's a story to be told about the positive influence of these biblical texts on the historical development of science. The story of Noah's flood, for one, was highly significant in shaping early scientific thinking on the earth. And Whiston himself proposed that the flood was caused by a comet encountering the earth, and this comet precipitated huge falls of rain and a vast tide that covered the planet. Now, of course, the science has moved on since Whiston's day, 
although the fascination of many scientists with the stories remains. And what's remarkable, I find, is that the modern day studies, which bring to bear the much advanced rigor of today's, scientists, uh, of today's sciences, have been able to find explanations, scientific explanations, for even the most spectacular and unlikely of the biblical miracles. And I'll give you some examples shortly. But my point is that there's almost nothing in the Bible that the modern sciences can't explain if sufficient in ingenuity is brought to bear. This flies in the face of our usual understanding of a miracle as an impossible event in natural terms, because these studies show us that the seemingly impossible biblical stories are quite possible in naturalistic terms, if unlikely. The incredible happens, but no laws of nature are violated. So what's going on? Do these studies disprove the miraculous nature of the stories by finding explanations, or do they affirm it? Well, a clue to what's at stake here is a surprising disagreement between the relevant experts. While the scientists believe their naturalistic explanations represent a major advance in understanding the stories, professional biblical scholars tend to show very, very little interest in these explanations or are completely disdainful of them, claiming that the explanations are implausible and that the scientists have misunderstood the texts. Well, it turns out that this disagreement has a precedent back in 19th century geology, when what was then a fairly new science was setting out its methodological stall. And I'll point out the striking parallels here between how the various experts, scientists and biblical scholars, interpret the scriptural witness on the one hand, and how geologists interpret the witness of the rocks on the other. In both cases, Bible and geology, we're faced with the question of how to interpret evidence from the past when there are competing explanations. In other words, this dispute about the Bible equally concerns how you do science. And I'll close by suggesting that the dispute also points us towards a rather overlooked kind of natural theology, which exposes the transcendent quality of nature in the Bible stories. And here we find but the scientific interpretations are apocalypses now. So with that extended introduction in mind, let me take you through some case studies. My favorite among these apocalypses is the parting of the Red Sea, where Moses leads the children of Israel, desperate to escape from slavery in Egypt, across the sea. Moses stretches out his hand over the water, and it divides forming a wall to the right and to the left. Moses and the people cross, but when Pharaoh follows, the sea crashes in on the Egyptians, drowning every one. Easily the most spectacular and incredible miracle story in the Bible, filmmakers have had a field day with the special effects here, from Cecil B. DeMille's first version of the Ten Commandments in 1923, up to Ridley Scott's Exodus Gods and Kings in, nine, in 2014, and I'm sure you've seen the visuals here of towering walls of water held magically apart while the Israelites scurry over the dry seabed like ants in comparison. Well, scientists have had a field day with this story too, and in spite of its seemingly impossible nature, there have been many scientific proposals which claim to explain the miracle in natural, if unusual, terms. And two approaches tend to dominate. The first suggests that the sea was a lagoon or, or a shallow inlet at the coast, which parted because of an enormous tsunami from a distant volcanic eruption. And the ob obvious candidate is the eruption of Thera, the volcanic island in the Egyptian we now call Santorini. You can see this on the, on the map on your handout. Santorini, Thera, was devastated by one of the largest eruptions in human history, probably in the late 1600s BCE. And the eruption caused large tsunamis and spread volcanic ash far and wide across the Eastern Mediterranean. So let's picture the scenario. Transport yourself to Egypt, where the Israelites are enslaved. The eruption is hundreds of miles away, 
but it creates atmospheric storms, earthquakes, and ash falls across the eastern Mediterranean, including Egypt in this scenario. The first nine plagues of Egypt, where water is turned into blood, then a plague of frogs appears, followed by lice, swarms of flies, a devastating sickness of cattle, boils, hail, locusts, and darkness for three days. All of these can be explained as consequences of the unfolding volcanic eruption far away. And the plagues are what allow the Israelites to escape. Now, by the time of the final, most explosive stage of the eruption, where the island literally blew itself apart, the Israelites have escaped to the Mediterranean coast, and they're standing on the shore of a lagoon, perhaps the Lake Sabonis on the map on your handout. The volcano's enormous magma chamber, now empty, fills with seawater, and that causes the sea to ebb away across the Mediterranean coast, and then creates a giant tsunami. So first the lagoon empties, Moses crosses with the Egyptians in hot pursuit. But just as the Israelites reach higher ground, the tsunami appears and the Egyptians are swept away. Well, this is a fairly typical scenario for reconstructing the sea crossing using the eruption of Thera. And you can find it developed in, in many scientific articles, books, and TV documentaries over the last few decades. I am a skeptic myself, though. I worry about the lack of material evidence that this eruption actually had any impact on Egypt. And there's also a notorious problem about timescales, because the eruption of Thera actually took place centuries before the usual time frame for the Exodus, which is 1200s. Remarkably, though, problems like this don't seem to stop the Thera theories being proposed. They keep coming up as the ideal solution, not only for the Exodus, but for other outstanding mysteries like the legend of Atlantis. This tells us, I think, something about the imaginative appeal of the Thera theories as Apocalypse is now, and I'll come back to that. Let's move on to the second naturalistic approach to the parting of the sea. This one makes use of tremendous winds to push the sea aside, and it has the advantage over the tsunami explanation of being exactly what the biblical text specifies, and you have the passage on your handout just above the maps. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. There's a further advantage with this explanation, too, because it works for pretty much any body of water you, might, you think might be the one that Moses crossed, whether it's one of the shallow lagoons on the north coast or one of the shallow lakes in the Isthmus of Suez or the deep Red Sea. Now, as you might expect, the most spectacular location is the Red Sea itself, and several models have been proposed here where a storm force wind is funneled down the, down the Gulf of Suez or the Gulf of Aqaba. And here, the topography of land and the seabed is such that violent winds blowing in the right direction for the right length of time can have a substantial effect on the sea level. And one calculation suggests that the sea in the Gulf of Suez could recede from the shore by nearly a mile under such conditions. So, and when the wind dies down, the sea returns. So you have Moses and the Israelites on the edge of the Red Sea when the storm arrives, and they're able to cross over during the night while the wind blows, but in the morning when the wind subsides, the sea returns and destroys the pursuing Egyptians. Now, it's important to point out that this kind of storm wind is by no means an everyday event. The model predicts that the conditions are right only every 1,000 to 3,000 years, so it's certainly not a miracle in the sense of laws of nature being broken, more in the sense of being such an unusual happening on a human time scale that it's probably not going to be remembered from one occurrence to the next. So in human terms, a storm which exposes the seabed to that degree would appear to be unprecedented, unique, and if you're at the right place at the right time, providential. So clearly then, in this model, if there's a miracle to speak of, it's that Moses and the Israelites happen to be in the right place at the right time. One scientist who makes a great deal of currency out of this point 
is the Cambridge material scientist Colin Humphreys. He's written a book-length treatment of the miracles of Exodus, claiming they can all be explained by naturalistic models like this. He doesn't want to explain the miracles away, far from it, rather to strengthen belief in the miracles. It isn't the nature of an event that makes it miraculous, he thinks, because a naturalistic explanation can be found for, for most claimed miracles. His point is, the miracle is in the timing. And he explains this by looking at the end of the, jo the uh, Exodus story, to Joshua 3, where Joshua and the Israelites have wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and they're finally ready to cross over into the Promised Land. Only one barrier stands in their way, the River Jordan. Miraculously, it stops flowing to allow them to cross. Well, Humphreys points out that the Jordan is, in fact, well known to stop flowing for short periods when an earthquake dislodges the riverbanks further upstream. This means that the miracle is in the timing. Joshua and the Israelites were standing on the banks of the Jordan at just the right time after the earthquake. For Humphreys, the fact that a naturalistic explanation is so readily at hand for this biblical story means that the miracle is more believable, not less. Now, Humphreys isn't doing anything new here. Go back to the 18th century Boyle lecturers I mentioned earlier, Samuel Clarke and William Whiston. This was exactly their point about biblical miracles. If science can confirm that the, that the miracles are plausible natural events, then that supports the authenticity of the Bible as a credible record of God's dealings with the world. So theirs is an apologetic argument, using science to uphold the biblical witness, not to downgrade the miracles to mere unusual events. The miracle is in the timing. God led Moses, Joshua, and the Israelites to the right place at the right time. To a skeptic, this might be coincidence. To a believer, it's providence. No laws of nature are violated, but still, God's providential purposes are achieved miraculously, and science provides confirmation in this view. Well, here we see the first of the unexpected reversals between science and theology that I mentioned earlier. In this view, science and theology are not in conflict. In fact, science is serving theology, helping theology. So, scientific studies of the Bible, far from disproving it as an ancient record of primitive superstition, can, if you're so disposed, be taken as evidence of the credibility of the Bible and of its witness to divine providence. The important assumption here is that the Bible tells us what really happened. But does it? Well, here we need to turn to the biblical scholars the professional historians, archaeologists, and linguists who bring a very different set of skills to the scientists. What do they think of this scientific work on the Bible's apocalypses? Not a lot. If you plow through the heavy scholarly commentaries or scour the research literature on Exodus, you'll be hard-pressed to find this scientific work even being mentioned. When it is, the assessment is usually dismissive, and to give you a flavor, here are three colorful statements from biblical scholars. First up is Maxwell and Hayes from their classic textbook, A History of Ancient Israel and Judah. And this is quotation A on your handout. Theories of this sort attempt to give naturalistic and scientifically acceptable explanations for the more fantastic and miraculous biblical claims. And they're speaking of the theory theories, by the way. In our opinion, however, these theories presuppose such hypothetical scenarios, such a catastrophic view of history, and such marvelous correlations of coincidental factors that they create more credibility problems of their own than the ones they're intended to solve. So the theory theories and other naturalistic theories of this sort, they say, are simply implausible. And note that this is quite an accusation when we're dealing with an incredible miracle story to begin with, but I'll say more about plausibility issues later. Here's the second assessment of scientific models from a biblical scholar. This is Bill Propp writing in his magisterial commentary on Exodus, quotation B. 
Any rigorous attempt to explain the whole plague's narrative as a naive but basically accurate report of a chain of natural calamities is doomed from the start. Rationalistic explanations for miracles are anachronistic today. To believe that the Bible faithfully records a concatenation of improbable events as interpreted by a pre-scientific society demands a perverse fundamentalism that blindly accepts the antiquity and accuracy of biblical tradition while denying its theory of supernatural intervention. So Prop is also worried about plausibility, but he adds more, and notice his phrase, perverse fundamentalism. His concern is that the scientific models treat the text at face value, ignoring the, fa the fact that the text arose in a world very different from our own. The, sci the scientists are reading the Bible like a fundamentalist would, he thinks, literally, under the assumption that it reports straightforward eyewitness testimony as it happened. And the scientists are also reading the Bible perversely, Prop tells us, not recognizing the theological presuppositions assumed by the text, presuppositions that a true fundamentalist would recognize immediately. There's also a concern about professional rivalry. And look at this final assessment from a biblical scholar, this time William Johnston writing on Colin Humphrey's scientific explanations of Exodus miracles. This is quotation C. Humphrey's predominant ignoring of scholarly tradition is matched by a breathtaking self-belief and self-reliance on his own personal experience. This quotation provides us with one final reason, I think, why biblical scholars are skeptical of scientific explanations of the Bible's miracles, and that is professionalization. The scientists are so caught up in their own professional bubbles, seems to be Johnston's point, that they overlook the highly specialized theological, historical, and linguistic problems raised by the text, problems that take years of training to master. A scientific training simply doesn't provide the correct expertise. Let me sum up so far. The scientists and the biblical scholars couldn't be more different. If the scientists assume that the biblical text provides data about amazing events from ancient times, the biblical scholars insist that we can't even begin to say what really happened back then before taking full account of the text we possess now. The stories certainly weren't recorded at the time. They circulated in oral form for centuries before being written down, slowly gathered together and edited into what we now call the Book of Exodus, which, in any case, comes to us from copies of copies produced centuries later still. There's plentiful evidence that in all that time, rich and creative theological thinking was being applied to make sense of what was being told thinking that made its way into the stories themselves as they were told and retold, recorded and re-recorded. The text of the parting of the Red Sea, for instance, seems to consist of four slightly different traditions that have been woven together, traditions that don't exactly agree on the details of what they describe, but you would hardly notice this on a surface level reading. More importantly, there are signs the story has been heavily influenced by a creation myth that was widespread in the ancient Near East, where the creator god battles with the sea personified as a dragon and divides her in two, forming heavens and earth. So the parting of the Red Sea in Exodus might look to us like an incredible miracle in time and space, but in the thought world of the ancient Near East, it also echo echoes a creation story telling of figurative new beginnings on a cosmic scale. Now, I could go on. There are many more things that could be said here, but the point is that if you want to discern what really happened way back then, the text we have now is the starting point of your journey, not the end. So you need to carefully sift through layers and layers of mythological, theological, and cultural interpretation, which are built into the very story itself before you get to the supposed historical kernel if it's indeed there in the first place. And that would be the consensus biblical scholarly approach to this story. So in other words, we have a very fundamental disagreement between two kinds of expert over the same basic evidence. 
The scientists believe they can find naturalistic models to explain what the text says happened to Moses. The biblical scholars insist that the everyday human phenomena of storytelling, reflection, explanation, and retelling of the story over and over again account for much of what we find in the text before we ever bring science to bear. You may be suspecting by now that my sympathies lie with the biblical scholars, and so they do. I've spent much of my life in science, but I've also spent quite a bit of it working in biblical scholarship too. And I'm firmly convinced that there's more to the matter of determining what really happened in miracle stories than finding an appropriate scientific explanation. But my point is not to take sides, but to explain how this divide between scientists and biblical scholars, between science and theology, if you like, leads us on to the second unexpected reversal that I mentioned between science and theology. For we now see that the scientists are the believers in the integrity and the literal reliability of the Bible, while the biblical scholars, the theologians, are the skeptics. The tables are turned. Science has become faith, theology has become disbelief. How did this divide between scientists and biblical scholars arise, and what does it mean for the culture wars between science and religion? Is it mere professional rivalry, or is there something deeper at stake? Well, I suggest to you that there is something very deep at stake here, and to see it, we need to go back to the 1830s, to a controversy known as the uniformitarianism catastrophism debate over how the then new science of geology should interpret the evidence of the past. Now, for the most part, doing geology is very different to the classic laboratory work that goes on in much of physics and chemistry, where experiments can be repeated again and again in real time, where key parameters can be isolated and varied at will, and where spurious effects can be controlled by adapting the environment. Well, geologists can do little of this. They simply can't replicate in the laboratory the enormous spatial and temporal effects they're interested in. Instead, much of their work needs to be carried out in the field, interpreting the fragmentary, scrambled, and highly context-dependent evidence that's available of the Earth's past. Does this sound familiar? It is, of course, an analogous problem to interpreting an ancient text like the Bible, dealing with the fixed, fragmentary, and perhaps scrambled evidence that has come down to us from a long-vanished culture with all its potential messiness and historical contextuality. Well, this is where the 19th century debate in geology comes in, because it concerns exactly this question of how to reconstruct the past given limited evidence. And I'll give you the soundbite version, which, like most soundbites, isn't entirely truthful, but it does at least capture the issues at stake. So put simply, the school of thought that we've come to call catastrophism assumes that from time to time in the Earth's past, the geology was shaped by sudden and dramatic cataclysms or catastrophes or apocalypses in effect, the likes of which we simply don't see today. So Noah's flood was often taken as probably the most recent such cataclysm, worldwide and devastating. And mountain chains like the Andes, for instance, were assumed to have been thrown up suddenly perhaps in a matter of minutes, hours, or days, by immense planet-shattering earthquakes. The opposing school of thought, on the other hand, uniformitarianism, insists that the rocks should be interpreted in completely the opposite direction, reading them largely in terms of gradual, imperceptible changes over vast time periods. Unless there's strong evidence to the contrary, goes this way of thinking, we should assume that the geological processes of the past are uniform with those of today, the mostly rather gentle, imperceptible processes we see, hence the name uniformitarianism. But time is the key. Given enough time, even the jagged immensities of the Andes can be explained by uniformity. As the mountains inch their way skywards, infinitesimally slowly on a human scale, but no less certainly for that. Well, this argument was eventually seen to be one in favor of uniformitarianism, which has dominated geology ever since. 
or at least it did until around 1980, because at that point a major shift in thinking occurred when it was discovered that the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period, when the dinosaurs died out, was probably precipitated by a massive asteroid impact, a global catastrophe in other words. So since 1980, the pendulum has swung back some way towards catastrophism, and ge geology today exists in a kind of a, a happier medium between the two schools of thought. But my point in rehearsing this debate, albeit very briefly and crudely, is to shed light on the divide between scientists and biblical scholars over how we interpret the Bible's stories of miracles and hypernature. I see clear parallels here between the rocks and the Bible over how to read limited evidence in order to reconstruct history. And I've put a schematic diagram on the handout to illustrate. Should we interpret the evidence in terms of one-off dramatic events, as catastrophism would have it, or will the evidence succumb to a more complex, mundane, and gradualist view, that of uniformitarianism? All things being equal, which should be the preferred approach, or is there a middle way? Take the sea crossing again. Is it best analyzed by a naturalistic model that takes the text at face value and explains the incredible events there by means of a nearly as incredible volcanic eruption and a series of amazing one-off coincidences where Moses just happens to be in the right place at the right time, is that, is that the best form of explanation? Or should the narrative be seen in terms of an evolutionary process where a much more mundane original story slowly accrues layers and layers of theological and mythological interpretation through the telling and retelling over generations until it eventually becomes the spectacular textual tradition that we possess now. While the first corresponds to the catastrophist approach, favored by many scientists who write on the biblical stories, the second is the uniformitarian view, defended by the majority of biblical scholars. So I'm suggesting that the divide between scientists and biblical scholars over how to read the Bible's apocalypses is parallel to the long-running debate on how to do an historical science like geology. In each debate, there are two schools of thought, both working with the same evidence, both applying radically different methodologies to reconstruct the past, one emphasizing the remarkable and the other emphasizing the mon mundane. Consequently, the two schools of thought arrive at radically different conclusions about that past. Which one is right? Either? Both? Neither? Well, the fact that geological science has itself shifted ground on this dilemma over the last two centuries suggests that there's no easy answer. Although, if we are to take contemporary geology as our guide, then some kind of creative synthesis of the two opposing camps of catastrophism and uniformitarianism would seem to be our best bet when looking at the Bible. And I want to move to my last section on natural theology by suggesting that this creative synthesis might in fact be the best way forward for appreciating the Bible's miracle stories and apocalypses. Let's return to plausibility issues. Remember that I quoted several biblical scholars who were, frankly, incredulous of the scientific models, wondering how anyone would take these unlikely naturalistic scenarios and amazing coincidences seriously. I'm sure the irony hasn't escaped you that the Bible stories themselves are unlikely and amazing. Have the biblical scholars missed the irony here? Well, no. For them, the story we have is so far removed from whatever might really have happened that there's little point in modeling it in, in natural terms. If there ever was one original story of the parting of the Red Sea, which is unlikely, we're incapable of discerning it at this remove because the story has slowly shifted like the sands and has gathered accretions and layers of truth over generations. Now, the biblical scholars have probability on their side. All other things being equal, a catastrophist interpretation where a, a one-off, unlikely event explains the evidence is inherently unlikely 
compared to a uniformitarian interpretation, which works with an evolutionary, everyday explanation. The probability of the remarkable naturalistic event is low by its very nature. The probability of human processes of myth-making and storytelling are virtually certain by comparison. And this point alone explains much of the disinterest that biblical scholars show towards naturalistic explanations. So when looked at as a human document, I'm with the biblical scholars. The scientific models of the Bible's miracles and apocalypses are frankly implausible, I think. But as a Christian and a theologian, the Bible is also for me a record of God's dealing with, dealings with the world. And this is where the scientific models have a place. And this leads me to mention my third and final reversal between science and theology. I think it's unlikely that the scientific models can tell us much about what really happened. They're not much use from the perspective of doing history with the text. From the perspective of doing theology, though, especially natural theology, I suggest the scientific models are invaluable. Remember that I've been emphasizing these biblical stories as apocalypses, as moments of revelation. In spite of their speculative and fantastic nature, I suggest that the scientific models offer a uniquely modern purchase on the transcendent, transcendent quality of these stories, on their ability to reveal the remarkable in the mundane, the sign of the divine. The fact that there are often multiple scientific models for the same miracle story, often competing with each other, is a bonus, not a problem to be resolved. The scientific models are, to me, creative and imaginative retellings of the stories in the Bible, but in the language of our own scientific world, highlighting for us the remarkable and stupendous character of God's relationship with nature. So my final message to you is, let's have more of these scientific models, not fewer. Let the scientists be more imaginative and the biblical scholars be more hard-headed and rational. Let science be more theological and biblical studies more scientific because it's at the level of natural theology that I suggest we should understand these scientific models as theological animations and reanimations of the evidence before us, namely the text of the Bible. The models are apocalypses now. Thank you. A complaint we sometimes hear about the discussion of science and religion is that it can be too abstruse too preoccupied with abstractions about the grounds of knowledge and belief. The concern is that questions of more immediate interest to religious believers and scientists among them are sidelined. The subject of Dr. Harris's lecture, the implications of modern science for the interpretation of the biblical miracles, surely is of mainstream interest. In thanking him for that enthralling lecture, I also want to congratulate him for the exceptional clarity he's brought to a topic that remains ever topical. When interviewed recently about his new book on William Tyndale, Melvin Bragg explained why he himself is a believing unbeliever. I find the resurrection of Christ impossible to accept. And on the question of eternal life, biology and physics won't let that happen. From time to time, we must all have considered what we mean by miracles and whether they need be understood as supernatural interventions. The word still thrives in popular culture, referring to highly improbable events of deep personal significance to those who experience them. For the parents of the baby born with a heart 
outside its body, the unprecedented surgery that successfully led to restoration was a miracle. We've been treated to a lecture rich in insight and full of implications for further reflection. I was particularly struck by the conundrum that Mark has put to us all. If a scientific explanation can be found that shows a scriptural miracle to have been possible, does that render the story more or less credible? And I shall return to that question in a moment. But first, a word about Mark's thesis that the professionalization of science and the professionalization of scriptural study, both 19th century developments, have led to serious divergence on how the miracle stories should be approached. For a historian of science like myself, his argument becomes more arresting with the claim that this divide between scientists and biblical scholars is, and I quote, parallel to the long-running debate on how to do an historical science like geology. And I see what he means. There is an analogy. In the uniformitarian geology of Darwin's mentor, Charles Lyell, the historical sculpting of the Earth's surface was explained by invoking only natural causes, acting with the same intensity as forces in evidence today. In the procedures of many biblical scholars, as they trace the historical processes that led to the biblical texts as we know them, only natural human agency is presupposed. Just as Lyle marginalized Noah's flood from the science of geology, so the biblical scholars to whom Mark refers marginalize a literalistic reading of the miracles. In the process, science-based apologists for the veracity of the narratives are generally sidelined as implausible and misconceived. There would, of course, be much to discuss here, but I'd like to pick out a related feature of the 19th century debate to which Mark referred. And it concerns an ambiguity in the theological implications of naturalistic explanation. In retrospect, as part of a secularist narrative, the uniformitarian geologists who followed Lyle became the heroes who expunged miracles from the Earth's history. Lyle's avowed aim had been to rid the science of Moses. The catastrophists, with their supposed preference, for dramatic divine intervention were the losers. Quite apart from the fact that catastrophes have made a comeback, geologically, if not theologically, there is a particular reason why the secularist narratives, when projected back to the 1830s, get the story wrong. And this is because one could be a uniformitarian like Lyle and still subscribe to a providentialist reading of nature. Lyle prided himself on having found a new argument for God's supervision of the world. It consisted in the fact that wherever on earth there was an environment that could support particular life forms, those very species had been introduced. In the adaptation of newly introduced species to their environmental niches, there was surely evidence of intelligent foresight. 
And was there not a miraculous plenitude in nature as these niches had all been filled? Conversely, but still contrary to the secularist narrative, there were geologists who did not identify their cataclysmic events with instances of divine intervention, just as with the asteroid collisions postulated today. Crucially, whether one was a uniformitarian or a catastrophist, it was not a case of having to choose between natural causes and the involvement at some level of a deity. And this is a point that I think has rather receded from view in our secular age. More often than not, from the mid-17th to the mid-19th century, scientific explanations invoking natural causes were interpreted theistically. And this was possible because the natural causes could be interpreted, as they were, by Robert Boyle and Isaac Newton as instruments of a divine will. For 200 years and more, the very existence of natural laws testified to God's existence. And it was not simply that laws presupposed a legislator. For the Cambridge polymath William Hewell, who first coined the word scientist in the 1830s, it was the remarkable combination of laws making intelligent life possible, which provided compelling indications of a creator. In this sense, scientific naturalism was deeply embedded in a Christian culture and not an alien threat from outside. This explains why Robert Boyle would compare God's relation to nature with that of an author to a book. Pen, paper, and ink were the natural instruments of the writer, who was nevertheless in immediate control of what went onto the page. It's why Isaac Newton could propose an analogy between God's activity in nature and our ability to move our limbs at will. It's why one of the original boy lecturers, Samuel Clark, could equate the normal course of nature with the way God normally chooses to act, but is not constrained to do so. It's why Anglican geologists of the early 19th century found in the fossil record a, ref a refutation, not a vindication of atheism. Species had not existed from eternity, as atheists classically argue. The new science of paleontology showed that new ones had kept appearing. It's why Darwin, even Darwin, could say when explaining what he meant by nature, by nature, I mean the laws ordained by God to govern the universe. In short, during its fascinating history, there has been no natural nature of naturalism. It's existed in a variety of theistic and non-theistic forms. And an important corollary is that scientific progress alone can never be a sufficient explanation for the expulsion of God from the world. Mark has reminded us that there's almost nothing in the Bible that the modern sciences can't explain if sufficient ingenuity is brought to bear, which leads us back to the conundrum he's voiced so well. Do these scientific accounts disprove the miraculous nature of the stories, or do they affirm it? Put crudely, his sophisticated answer is that much depends 
on where you are coming from depends on what you are disposed to believe in the light of your own experience, which may include education in a scientific discipline or in the historically based discipline of biblical studies. And I welcome his analysis because it has great fertility. It generates questions that we may even with profit ask of ourselves. What account would we give of the origins of our own predispositions? It is, of course, a question historians have to ask when interrogating their biographical subjects. And here is the interesting point, or one of them. The reasons given for their loss of faith by major figures in the secularist movements of the late 19th and 20th centuries rarely refer to the primacy of science. From the autobiographical testimony of some 150 unbelievers in the period 1850 to 1960, the Oxford social historian Susan Budd discovered that conversions to unbelief often mirrored, mirrored a change from conservative to more radical politics. Religion was rejected as part of established privileged societies. The reading of radical texts such as Tom Paine's Age of Reason was another prominent influence. Ironically, another frequently mentioned subversive book was the Bible itself. But it was not that science had proved the biblical miracles impossible. Disenchantment had been rooted in a moral sensibility, in a recoiling from Old Testament depictions of a vengeful and anthropomorphic deity. In 1912, the president of the National Secular Society in Britain protested that biblical stories of lust, adultery, incest, and unnatural vice were enough to raise blushes in a brothel. <laughs> Not wishing to end this response in a brothel, <laughs> I have a couple of questions that were this a dialogue I would put to Mark. The first relates to naturalistic assumptions in the historical practices of biblical scholarship. History is one of the most secular academic subjects. In that, historians do not appeal to divine activity as a mode of explanation. And this is where Marx's analogy with geological uniformitarianism has substance. In his own words, the biblical scholar has to carefully sift through layers and layers of mythological, theological, and cultural interpretation, which are built into the very story itself before you get to the supposed historical kernel, if indeed it's there in the first place. Layers and layers, just as the geologists have had to sift through their strata upon strata. But if there is a methodological naturalism inherent in biblical scholarship, as there is in the sciences, how do biblical scholars decide whether their historical trajectories for the contents of biblical texts are destructive or affirmative of faith. What predispositions come into play when they ask whether the miracle stories do, as Marx suggests, possess a transcendent quality as moments of revelation? My second question comes from a glance back to Marx's assertion that there is 
almost nothing in the Bible that the modern sciences can't explain if sufficient ingenuity is brought to bear. Now, I'm wondering about the almost nothing. What still lies beyond scientific encroachment? For Robert Boyle, writing in the 17th century, there were matters above reason. And they would have included the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As he wrote in a text of 1675, the resurrection is not to be brought to pass according to the common course of nature, I presume. After the universal experience of so many ages, which have afforded us no instances of it. One of Boyle's most original contributions to a Christian natural philosophy was his explanation for how it might be possible for personal identity to survive death without persons having to reside in a body identical to their earthly one. But the primary supernatural aspect, as for the majority of Christians before and since, was the resurrection of the dead Christ. And my question would simply be, is this not a case where the scientific impossibility of the event remains sacrosanct? A dialogue between Melvin Bragg and Robert Boyle would not, I think, be without interest. Thank you once again, Mark, for such an accessible, authoritative, and stimulating lecture. You will have heard that tonight is a significant moment in the history of the modern series of these lectures. It is the 15th. And while the lectures will continue to be presented here for the immediate years, they will, to our great delight, be a collaboration with the Distinguished International Society for Science and Religion. And we are pleased that next year's lecturer will appropriately be the Reverend Professor Michael Rice, Professor of Science Education at UCL and President of that society. But I would be less than assiduous tonight as parish priest if I did not set before you our gratitude to Dr. Michael Byrne, who lays down his burden of care and support for the project this evening. He it was who first proposed the idea of this revival, which we seized with enthusiasm. And he has brought each and every lecture to fruition by dint of de detailed and careful administration in which nothing has been left to chance, and even less to me. <laughs> he has not faltered in active generosity to the project, as in continued and refined concern for the issues, as also the personalities who have become friends of this place. The reputation of the series depends largely on his tenacity, stamina, and judgment. So as we leave, may I ask you to rise and to thank our speakers, and especially Michael Byrne.